At Metro East, we know there's a lot of great work going on in our community, and we want to share that with you. On Community Hotline, we highlight local nonprofits, schools, and government agencies that have their feet on the ground and are working to make our neighborhoods a better place. Hello, I'm Monica Weitzel, the host of Metro East Community Hotline program. First up, we'll be celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month by talking with our partner at the Portland Latin American Film Festival. Find out all the details so you can celebrate too. Then we'll take you to the groundbreaking of Gresham's Cascade Groundwater Project. This bold step by the City of Gresham and the Rockwood Public Utilities District will make a difference to East County residents for generations to come. And finally, we'll talk with two program directors from Elso Inc., formerly Camp Elso. This program for black and brown youth has expanded in important and impactful ways. Please join me for tonight's show. It's all coming up next on Community Hotline. September 15th to October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month. In recognition of this, Community Hotline is featuring Portland Latin American Film Festival, now in its 15th year. With us today to talk about the Portland Latin American Film Festival is Maria Ostroth. Maria, it's great to see you again. Oh, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for the yes. opportunity. Is there anything over the last I don't know, 15 years that, that really stands out or that is memorable to you about about the film festival as you've as you've gone through the the different versions of it well i'm i really uh, like that we uh, were able to bring some directors to portland to talk to the audience probably like five years ago we brought these um djs from tijuana uh bostich and fusible they are very popular in mexico and in big uh music festivals around the world. So I'm a big fan. And there was a documentary about um, sonidos or sounds of Tijuana. And uh, we were able to invite the director of the film. And also we closed after the, the movie with a nice party dancing with electronic uh, music. And what I like about them is that they mix uh, like a Norteño music uh, it's like a special kind of music in the north of Mexico with electronic uh, beats and rhythms and samples. One of the things that makes me excited about the festival is the opportunity not only to see the movies, but also to talk to the uh, directors or the people behind the movies and bring them to, to Portland so the people also can interact with them and learn a little bit about the process of uh, making a film. Right, and, and they get a chance to ask questions about the movie and, exactly. and uh, about their process, or just um, sometimes just get a little bit of background about why did you do this or why did you do you know why did you choose mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So, what about this year, the fifteenth year? What what can we expect in this year's uh, event? When mm -hmm. I started this uh, festival, it was the idea to create community and watch films, learn from our cultures, and also enjoy the films with other people. And after the movie, grab a drink, a coffee or whatever, and just talk about the films. I think that movies are better enjoyed when you are with others. So last year, we had to stay home because of the uh, circumstances. However, uh, this year, we know that this is not over yet, but at least we know that we have the vaccine and many people have been vaccinated and we can cover our mouths and using the masks. So that gives us some relief, right? So the Hollywood theater will give us 50% uh, only capacity. So okay. the theater holds probably like 400 people. So we are expecting to sell like around 200 uh, tickets. Okay. And still it's a good amount of mm -hmm. people in a, in a screening. So don't be afraid if you want to go to the movies, just uh, make sure that you bring your mask mm -hmm. and uh, if you are vaccinated, even better. <laughs> People have really missed going out and having those social, you know, those social occasions when they can, they can talk to people, whether it be the person that they came with or, or a stranger, because you know, that's, that's part of what community is all about. So if, you know, if we're able to do this in a, you know, a relatively safe environment then I think that's that's a good thing uh, so so it's going to be at the Hollywood Theater again they've yes. been a great partner uh -huh. uh, yeah and um, and it's a series of films correct yes so exactly. it starts September what when's the first 22nd, it's, 22nd. Uh, on a Wednesday so it's uh, four weeks from this uh, Wednesday 
uh, September 22nd at the Hollywood Theater. All the screenings will start at 7.30. I'm very excited because this year, again, we are going back to the theater. Hopefully mm -hmm. everything is going to remain as we are planning. And um, also we always have brought films that haven't been available in any other like uh, platforms like Netflix right. or that's one of our policies, right? Um, but this year, because it's a very special occasion, we are going to start the film festival with an old movie, oh. a movie that is celebrating 20 years. And the name of the movie, and I'm going to say it in Spanish, I, I'm, I'm sure they will know this movie, is Y tu mamá también, or And Your Mama Too. Yeah, this movie was released 20 years ago, and it was oh. one of the first films by Alfonso Cuarón. And actually... He um, co-produced and co-directed this film with his brother, Alejandro Cuarón. Mm -hmm. So, and this movie also made very famous worldwide, um, Gael Garcia Bernal and uh, Diego Luna. So right. they are very young, very handsome, and it's a, it's a funny movie. And for me, it brings me memories for when it was. It, it, just, it does for me too. I remember my daughter was the first one that, that showed me that movie. I think it was probably the first Spanish language film I ever saw. And oh, I, really? And I, and I loved it. I loved it. So I, I have to take a look at that one too. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's a good thing. That's one of the um, things that I really like about the festival. It doesn't matter if you know Spanish or not. You, you know, if, if you don't know English, whatever, it's you, you, anybody can watch it because you'll have either subtitles or. or yes, um, they definitely you know. will have subtitles. Title. Yeah, so, right. so I'm very excited. It's one of my favorite movies. So it brings me memories from home, from Mexico, yeah. the beaches yeah. in Mexico, the beaches that I remember going when I was growing up, like uh, sunny with uh, coconuts. And uh, so it's just <laughs> yeah. nice. I'm looking forward to that. So um, we will go ahead and um, plan on going to the Portland Latin American Film Festival that will be starting on September 22nd. You can go to the website. We'll have the dates and all the information that people need. And uh, we'll, ch we'll check it out there and, and hopefully get to see some of our old friends and new friends at the, at the film festival. Yeah, and I was going to mention also that the Facebook page is one mm. of the best ways oh, for okay. people for, for people to follow up and just to see what is going on and all the details. They can also contact me directly, and I will be I will make sure that all their questions are answered. So just okay. look at the Portland Latin American Film Festival either on Instagram or in Facebook. Those are the best. That's ways to way. reach out okay sounds good we will see you there then thanks so very much maria i appreciate it thank and, you very uh, much for the opportunity the and we'll see you at the movies nos okay. vemos en el cine sounds good thank you you bet and thanks uh, for watching this segment of community hotline we'll see you at the festival thank you. Clean and affordable water is essential to the health and safety of any community. On this special Community Hotline field segment, we'll be taking you to the groundbreaking of a bold new project, ensuring local residents will have a sustainable water source for years to come. Water is our critical resource. Water is key to everything we do. Water is a very important area of concern for a lot of different reasons. The Cascade Groundwater Alliance is a partnership between the Rockwood Water People's Utility District and the city of Gresham to build and develop a groundwater supply to fully provide water to our communities. Nuts and bolts, so we're going from what's called the surface water supply, so the water falls from the sky and is collected in a, in a lake, uh, to as opposed to we're going to construct wells and we're going to pump the water out of the ground. It's critical to invest in our water infrastructure, not only to have the amount of water that you need for your community, but also to make sure that it is a great water quality, that it is something that will help us to protect um, and preserve the health of our community. We're at really a, a key moment in kind of water history here where some things are transitioning with the city of Portland water supply. So both Gresham and Rockwood have had long-term relationships with the city of Portland as wholesale water customers. Uh, we're at a point where their supply picture is changing 
with some of the treatment options that they're having to construct, which is going to raise their wholesale costs. We have 10 packages that this project is divided into, and what you see right behind me is the beginning of construction on package one, which will build a six million gallon reservoir, Cascade Reservoir number two. It will develop and build a groundwater well, uh, as well as some pipeline. The overall Time frame for all the packages is approximately five years with the last year for testing. The benefits to our community are lower future rates. That's a significant impact to our, our residents here. We have analyzed our, our rates and determined that we need to develop our own groundwater source to be more economical and provide a more resilient uh, system to, to the, our customers and to the region. The groundbreaking is actually the first big event where we're uh, constructing a reservoir on site here at the Rockwood facilities. Gresham at this moment is really the envy of communities throughout the West that are in water crisis. Uh, we will now be able to make decisions with the opportunities for public involvement on cost, on capital improvements. Uh, our Cascade uh, groundwater system will belong to our communities. Our goal is to have 26 million gallons of water system in service by 2025, one that we own and operate. That's enough water for our communities today and far into the future. It is really exciting to see the level of involvement from all of our staff members. Uh, even this groundbreaking ceremony we had, uh, uh, all of our staff were contributing. Genuinely, this is a once in a lifetime project. Uh, City of Gresham specifically has been a wholesale customer of the City of Portland for more than 100 years. It, it doesn't happen very often that a city will switch sources. So the opportunity to look at really changing kind of the whole supply picture for the City of Gresham is just, it's, it's pretty incredible for me as an engineer. We're going to get to shape things that are going to affect the water supply for the city for generations to come. Engaging with nature provides all sorts of benefits, but kids from communities of color have a more difficult time accessing those benefits. Thanks to ELSO, a number of those children in the Portland area were able to experience the benefits of nature this summer. And on this segment of Community Hotline, we'll find out how ELSO is also responsible for transforming that interest in nature into environmental social justice programs for high schoolers. With us today to talk about ELSO is Jamie Newsom, Program Director of Wayfinders and Tap and Roots, and Jackie Santalucia, Program Director for Your Street, Your Voice, and Empower Her. Welcome to Community Hotline, ladies. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks nice. for having us. Yes, you're welcome. It's nice to have you here. So, Jamie, let me start with you. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the Wayfinders program in just a few sentences? Like, what is the, what is the goal or the, or the main uh, mission of that particular program? Yes, so for Wayfinders, the main mission for us is that we, per, uh, we educate our black and brown youth about outdoor STEAM education um, through a lens, through a cultural lens as well. So that's our main goal. And for Wayfinders, especially it's an affinity space for our black and brown youth. So this is where they can come, feel connected to the outdoors, but as well as feel comfortable enough to be themselves. Yeah, so the, the kids that get involved in this programs, um, what ages are they and what and, and who are the kids? They are grades kindergarten through eighth grade um, and then they come from Portland and the close surrounding areas. It's 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 about communing with nature and getting engaged with nature but there's a lot of learning going on as well right? Yes. What, what kinds of things do you do to to teach the kids um, how to be I assume you teach them how to be good stewards of our environment and and um, you know what other kinds of things are important that you teach them during these these sessions or your camps? So the biggest thing is just getting these kids outdoors, um, especially with this past year, they've been stuck inside. So my main goal this summer was to get them outdoors and to get them having fun, being kids again. So uh, some fun things that we did this past summer is something new was squid dissection. 
I was able to teach all the camp guides how to do it. So then they were able to do it with our kids. We were able to adapt that program to be able to teach it with all of our grades. Um, and then we did garden pots. They were able to design some garden pots and plant. And the cool thing about that is Jackie actually came out and was able to do some educating in our garden. But we try to do everything outdoors, get the kids outside, having fun, playing, but as well as learning. And then the cool thing is that they probably don't realize that they are learning probably because they're having so much fun outdoors. So, so how does that work for you, Jackie? You, you usually work with the older kids, don't you? Or the teenagers, the high schoolers? Yes. Um, yeah, the programs, Your Street, Your Voice, and Empower Her are usually for 14 to 20-year-olds, but it, this was such a wonderful collaboration. Um, and we built out an arclet with a, a series of 18 garden bed, raised garden beds that were at the location where camp is being held. So um, the Wayfinders crew got to make sun tea out of the herbs and we, we made sal fresh salads and they got to go scavenger hunting to see what was harvesting. So it was just a really beautiful collaboration. Well, then tell me a little bit about, about your program then, uh, Jackie. You, you have a couple different programs that you run. Um, tell me about the Your Street, Your Voice. Because that's yeah. it's environmental, but it has it's a different... So, yes. That. So Your Street, Your Voice and Empower Her are, are both um, project-based learning programs, either after school or in class, that are looking at real projects, built environment projects that is introducing design as a tool for racial justice. And it's centering youth ages 14 to 20 that are Black, Indigenous, um, mm -hmm. students of youth of color in the Portland metro area. Um, however, because of this year, we were really fortunate to do virtual. So we actually, we've expanded our reach and have gotten a lot of students from across the country and, ac and um, across the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. So the programs are really um, centered, very similar to Jamie, and this is just the ethos of, of ELSO. Um, culturally competent and culturally relevant. So oftentimes, and the impetus of Elso and Your Street, Your Voice and Empower Her is um, rebuilding relationships with communities of color with the natural and the built environment. One of the things that we do is we know all of our students from ages five to, to 20 have innate knowledge and an innate relationship with the environment, whether that's a built environment, whether that's the natural environment. And so I think what we love to do is just creating spaces where students feel comfortable to just explore and experiment and really unlock that lived expertise that they have. You must do a lot of working with them on, on critical thinking and those kind of things about how to, how to really uh, yes. figure out what issues are important and, and what affects their lives. Absolutely. So my background, I'm an architect. I've been practicing for 15 years. So the built environment and design in general is critical thinking. I think often, and any type of environmentalist work is critical thinking. Um, I, I don't remember the statistic, but I think it's 90% of our time is being in the indoors. And we've experienced that even more during COVID. And so what your environment is, it's the space that's surrounding you. And when we are very, very young and in every moment in our life, we are being impacted by the environment around us. And oftentimes in communities of color, they don't get to choose their environment. They don't have the choice or agency about that. And so oftentimes it negatively impacts them because they didn't have any um, agency or choice to have any type of decision or, or power and control of that. And so I think it, we think about the environment natural and built as completely integrated. It's just the spaces that you occupy. Tell me about some of the kids. How is it, what is their reaction to being out there? Some of the kids maybe that don't get out in nature hardly at all. Um, do, you, do you find that they are, are some of them scared or are they mostly just loving it or, or what's their reaction? I would say most of them are loving it. Most of yeah. them really enjoy um, doing the trips and tours that we do. This past summer, we went to the zoo. They have this amazing program, excuse me, program called ZAP which um, is a program for when we arrived at the zoo, we were met by a, a group of teens of color and they actually led our kids around the zoo and were able to provide an amazing experience for our kids. And that's the biggest thing about Wayfinders is that when we do have guest educators, we try to prioritize the black and brown guest educators just so these kids can look at see these guest educators and possibly see themselves. Do you talk about careers at all or do they ask about that or is it just kind of a natural um, 
you know, offshoot of the program. Yes, they definitely asked about that, especially for our internship. We, um, we have certain symposiums that we offer our interns to try to help them figure out what they are, how, where they would like to see themselves in the upcoming future. Um, the internship really focuses on the green sector. And so we have different symposium topics each month that kind of just give them an idea of where they can see themselves. And so with that being said, that those interns bring that into Wayfinders. And then as well as my programming brings that into Wayfinders as well, giving them different type of STEAM outdoor education, taking them on different field trips and tour sites to where they probably even never thought that you could do this as a career. You know? Yes, especially after I believe the kids went fishing because we had a week of ocean oceanography, marine biology. And so that week was filled with tons of outdoor stuff close to the water, swimming, fishing. There was a week of waterways where our older kids build a boat. And I think uh, doing that kind of stuff, and they also sailed, they probably never imagined that they could even do a career like that. Tell me a little bit about the other programs. The Tap and Roots is actually a year-round internship, and that's specifically for Black identified high school and college age students. Yeah. And so this internship year round, we met once a month and we had to go from in-person to virtual back to in-person because of COVID, but we're able to offer symposiums that had topics. So for instance, we offered trauma-informed care as a topic. We offered implicit bias, microaggressions, uh, the power of story was a topic. We offered uh, a topic that had to do with college. So like college prep uh, to get the kids ready to see if they had any questions about college and what they needed to prepare. So those are just some great examples of symposiums that we were able to provide these kids. And little did they know it was slowly getting them ready for the summer work that they were gonna be doing. So a lot of those symposium topics, it's topics that I actually train our camp guides on, like implicit bias, trauma-informed care, microaggression, stuff like that. Um, Jackie, tell me about uh, Empower. Is that, it's, it's just for women or, or girls that are female identified? Yeah, so I believe it's like women, femme, girl identifying folks as early as 12 years old drop out of STEM due to systems of patriarchy and systems of being bullied and and gender roles and all of that. And so Empower Her came from a group of youth that have participated in Your Street, Your Voice prior that was looking for a space that was centering women, femme, trans, non-binary folks. So just to have one layer less of patriarchy to actually really explore and feel, feel comfortable making mistakes and feel comfortable right. having that type of experience that this is just an experiment. This is not like a end all be all thing just to try. And so this past year for Empower Her, I think one of the, the wonderful things that we did was we had a series of um, virtual um, programs, but in the spring we were able to have students um, that or women, femme, trans, non-binary identifying folks to actually learn about construction. And so we, we partnered with Girls Build and Walsh Construction and Anderson Construction. And all these students were able to, to learn about power tools and they actually constructed, constructed our 40 foot parklet. And so the power of having that type of technical education it builds so much confidence with, with women femme identifying folks, especially during this time where we've had so much isolation and just like continuous trauma as, as a result of just all of, all of the racial oppression in the systems that we work in. One thing I do wanna share is both Your Street, Your Voice and to power her as well as tap and roots. These are paid programs. So our, we pay That's our right. students to participate. And so That's it's a big differentiator because we consider our we consider our participants lived experts and consultants to, to build the better, better world that we want to have. And so I think that it is also it eliminates barriers of entry to the industries that we want to be we want to be cultivating. Thank you both, Jamie and Jackie, so much for sharing today about ELSO and about the programs you have there. And um, we're really happy that we have people out in the community doing that work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. you bet. And thanks to our viewers for watching today. I hope you learned something. I think it's a, a great program. And do check them out on their website. And I'm Monica Weitzel. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.